you, I love you. And as a kid, in this room, hearing that voice, I remember crossing my arms, shutting my eyes, and thinking, oh my gosh, nobody told my dad what happened. <laughs> Parents and grandparents and leaders sitting in the first four tables, do you think my dad knew what happened, yes or no? <laughs> oh, yes. And he's furious. He's like gasoline and what an idiot. He's furious all the way up until the moment when he pulls back this curtain and he's reminded again what matters. Perspective can be so grace filled to be reminded again, parents and grandparents and students and teachers and headmasters, what actually matters in life? Because you may not pick up that perspective if you watch the debates. I'm just saying, you may not, okay? You may not. But we do need perspective again on, first, first of all, how blessed we are as a nation. How remarkably blessed we are to be in this school today. Are you kidding? Have you ever walked around the halls? Have you ever felt the pulse of the student body? We're blessed. Let's know that first. And let's also realize we can't do it by ourselves. We need our community. We need our teams. We need our teachers. We need our family. We need our friends. We need donors. We need volunteers. And I was lucky as a little boy, not just to have my parents, but to have a huge community supporting me. Uh, growing up in St. Louis, you know, I, I realized I liked a lot of sports. Probably growing up in Minneapolis, maybe some of you like sports as well. Scooting past those two into this picture. Maybe you like them. Maybe even at one point in your, in your life, you've held on to one of these. <laughs> it, it's even possible, I realized, that you were at a game in 1987 when they played a very, very, very good National League opponent in the World Series <laughs> named the St. Louis Cardinals. I'm a Cardinal man. I love the Cardinals. I got burned on January 17, 1987. It's the same year the Twins are going to battle the Cardinals in the, in the World Series. The doctors came in. They tied me down to the bed. It's to control contractures. My lungs were burned and damaged. I can't breathe, so they put a hole in my neck. Students, what's that hole called? You got a trach. So I have a trach now. I can, can't breathe on my own. I cannot eat or drink, and I cannot talk. It's like being in class. <laughs> or church, for some of us. But I can feel. I can pray, I can think, I can meditate, I can dream, and I can listen. And whether you grew up in the, as a Twins fan or a Cardinals fan or maybe somewhere in between, back in the 80s, we had a voice in St. Louis that some of you may still recognize named Jack Buck. Jack has a son now named Joe that the younger folks among us may recognize. Joe Buck does the World Series and the Super Bowl, but Jack was my hero. I never met this guy, but I listened to him every single night as a child growing up. I got burned on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon. I'm laying on the cliff of death, leaning forward in total darkness when my door opens up. Footsteps enter in. I hear a cough, a chair, and then a voice. And the voice speaking light into my darkness says, Kid, wake up. You are going to live. You are going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark will make it all worthwhile. Kid, are you listening? And then Jack Buck says, keep fighting. Keep fighting. He walks out of that room. He leaves a nine-year-old in darkness by himself on morphine absolutely on fire for life. Have you ever had that experience? Okay. I am not asking if you've ever been burned on 100% of your body. <laughs> Please. And Jack Buck came to visit you. And if that is your story, come see me afterwards, okay? We're taking it on the road. We can kill it together. Have you ever had a bad day? Yes or no? Yes. Of course. We all have, if you're honest about it. 
in the midst of one of your bad days, have you ever had one person, a classmate, a teacher, a headmaster, a friend, a custodian, a parent, a grandparent, a stranger, one person, come into your life, say or do one thing, and your entire day changed? Ever happened? Yes. Me too. A lot of times, actually. But one time I remember distinctly. January 18th, 1987, when I was in that bed dying. I learned later on that when Jack left, he walked down the hall, about two rooms, eventually he put his head against a glass door and he just started weeping, which we all know is the sign of great weakness. Yes? I mean, if you're crying in every class period, come see me. Okay, too much emotion. But occasionally, and I'm talking primarily to the men in the room. I think the women already get this. They live it. Brothers, it's not weakness, it's strength. And it's not only that, it's scripturally based advice. The shortest verse in the entire Bible. Anybody know what it might be? Jesus wept. I love that line. Jesus wept. It's not weak, it's strength. This guy wept. He's a war hero, Purple Heart recipient from the Battle of the Bulge, who wept. Something broke his heart. One of the nurses walked over to the only celebrity we have in St. Louis. <laughs> she gets down on her knees, looks up, and she says, Mr. Buck, are you okay? Uh, we can't lose you. <laughs> and the gentleman looks back down and says, I'm not sure. The little boy won't make it, will he? And the expert, and we all have experts in our lives, don't we? The expert on her knees, looks up and says, Mr. Buck, there is absolutely not a chance. It is just his time. It's just his time. Let him go. And when this diagnosis shows up in our country, in our global environment, in our families, in our communities, in our businesses, in our marriages, in school, on the sports field, not a chance. How we respond matters. Where we turn matters. The question we ask matters. The prayers we offer matter. What this great guy does is he takes it home and then reflects, prays, and journals one question. What more can I do? What more can I do? The following day, a little guy named John O'Leary is hanging out in a burn center by himself. The doors open up. I hear footsteps. A chair, a cough, a voice, and the voice says, kid, wake up. I'm back. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm back. You are going to live. You are going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark will make it all worthwhile. And then he leaves. And then Providence the following day. Kid, wake up. Uh, this man came into my life over the next five months and guided a little boy with very little chance home. A month later, we took it downtown and we had a party. Uh, that's me on the left. Okay. <laughs> and a guy named Whitey Herzog that you might have beat in the World Series on the right. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark was awesome, but that night he learned that the little guy, John, can't get out of a wheelchair. I have no muscle mass. I wasn't always the hawking athlete you see in front of you today, okay? It wasn't always my story, juniors and seniors. I had to work hard to weigh 104 pounds. So he sees a little boy with no muscle mass, a little guy in a wheelchair, a little guy who can't hold anything in his hands, a little guy who is scarred, really scarred and busted up and broken from his neck to his toes. It's a bad image. And if you want to just focus on what is wrong, have at it. The media will join you in that pursuit. But there is another perspective to the story, a perspective we live out, I think, through our Christian faith. When you look at this little guy, besides the scars, besides the cardinal hat, what jumps off that image at you? See it? Joy. Happiness, peace. And ultimately, I think the word we're really all clamoring for, we don't talk about it frequently, but this is it, content. The kids learn to be content in almost any situation. 
What a gift. What a blessing that frequently does not come only in success. We frequently learn that <laughs> during the persecution, during the difficult times. Jack sees the good and the bad. He takes home both, cries, prays, reflects, and journals on one question. And the following day, I get this baseball in my mailbox. Ozzie Smith was a Hall of Fame shortstop. Below the ball was a note from Jack, that red kid. If you want a second baseball, all you have to do is send a thank you letter to the man who sent the first. Do you think I can write? Yes or no? But do you think I want a second baseball? Yes or no? <laughs> do you think I write then? Yes or no? Earlier, your headmaster quoted a guy you may not have heard of named Victor Frankl, who survives the Holocaust. And one of the great quotes from Frankl is this, when you know your why, you can endure anyhow. That's worth remembering. When you know your why, students and teachers and parents and family and friends, you can endure anyhow. This little boy is compelled now by the why of a second baseball, sent off a, a letter. A couple days later, I got a second baseball with a second note that said, kid, if you want a third baseball. <laughs> then I got a, another baseball a few days later that said, kid, if you want a fourth baseball. Kid, if you want a fifth baseball. Kid, <laughs> if you'd like that 60th baseball. 60. Teaching a little nobody named John how to write again. One person profoundly impacting one other person's life. Brought me back to grade school, middle school, high school, Catholic education all the way through. It's also what I send my kids to today. I believe in it. I think it's worth the investment. Four years at high school, eventually nine years at St. Louis University. <laughs> Somehow you graduate in spite of yourself, in spite of your many flaws. And graduation night, students and teachers and parents and grandparents and friends and donors and Mike. Love shows up. I never dated in high school, not as a junior, not as a senior. And I never dated in university. But graduation night from college, love shows up right on time. So can I show you the picture of love, yes or no? Yes. She's gorgeous, prepare yourselves. And hot might be the better term for it, OK? <laughs> Here she is. Jack Buck. <laughs> Who'd you expect? <laughs> I said love, not lust, not a girlfriend, not marriage. Love. Love looks so unlike frequently what we expect that we will kill her. And if you don't believe me, turn around and look up at the cross. It's the perfect example of love, hung on a cross. Love seldom looks like what we expect, but it's more profoundly beautiful than we can imagine. That night, love shows up in my life in the form of a 77-year-old man named Jack Buck with Parkinson's disease and stage four cancer. Love, one more time. With a package and a note, the first word on the note was kid. This means a lot to me. I hope it means a lot to you, too. Enjoy it's yours. I open up the package, look inside. And before I show you what he gave, he showed up that night first by asking this question. Students and family, what more can I do? Kid, this means a lot to me. I hope it means a lot to you, too. Enjoy it's yours. This is the baseball that I received when I went into the Hall of Fame. It's made of crystal. It's priceless. There's only one like it in the entire world. Don't drop it. <laughs> and then he writes, and it's yours. That love, I think, allowed a little boy to finally believe in himself, which led to this picture of love, also known as the greatest sales job in my entire life. <laughs> I have a cousin here, Kaki and Tony. These are fr family friends, so I just want to recognize them real quick. So Kaki and Tony, thank you for coming in. These are folks that live in your community. They know Beth. They know her heart. They know she's beautiful. But more than that, they know that she's got a great heart. That's what I married. We also have this little guy named after one of the great teachers in our life, Jack. Jack now has a little brother named Patrick. And when I'm out of town traveling to Minneapolis, my wife, to punish me, will take my two little fellas 
and then she'll dress them. <laughs> like that. Which is why I must catch my flight this afternoon to rip those outfits off. I love them. There's nothing they can do about it. I remind them to be kind to their little brother, Henry. I encourage the three boys to be nice to their little sister. And her name, I think appropriately today, Grace. 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 You find, if you travel too frequently, though, that two parents that have dark hair, <laughs> can have two babies with blondes. So I'm going to come back next year. We're going to talk about forgiveness. It's going to be an awesome topic. When you look at that picture, you're not seeing hair color or political parties. You're not seeing all the issues that seem to divide us locally and globally. You're seeing a guy who's been well loved who has embraced that in his own life and who's finally received it from others now, like in a, in a powerful way and able to give it back. And hopefully you see a reflection of what is true in your own life, that you have received well, that you've been well loved, and that it is our call, my fellow friends, to now provide it to a community start for it. And maybe the best way we can do it is to ask a simple question. What more can I do? What more can I do? I'd like you to spend the next 90 seconds reflecting on this question. And while you do, a guy that has no fingers is going to sit behind this screen. I'm going to lift it up here in a moment. And you'll find that there's a piano back there. My, my dad has Parkinson's disease. He's had it for 28 years. And I'd like to play my dad's favorite song today. But while I play, don't think about my dad. Don't think about me. Don't think about Jack Buck. Don't think about homework in period four. Don't think about the business meeting you got to get to at 10 o'clock. Think about what more you can do to be a living example of Christ in a community start for it. What more can you do? There, there was one good thing about being burned, and it was that I would never have to take piano lessons again. And then my mean mom made me take them anyway. And today, as an old guy in front of you, I'm so grateful that she did. So this is my dad's favorite song. He's actually in hospital right now. He had a, a surgery yesterday to replace some broken bones in his hip. amazing grace and it is the way my dad lives his life he uh, has been in a wheelchair for the last several years almost incapable of speaking for the last 12 months and yet the dude has the biggest grin of anybody out of a couple hundred on his face today I promise you and it's not just the morphine that he's taking <laughs> the man mainlines life and he mainlines his faith and the cross for him is not just a promise for others it's a promise that he believes in himself and is available to all of us. What a gift. Uh, I, I realize we're going to run up against the bell here shortly, but my hope as we move toward it was to see if any of you, my friends, had any questions. So if you have any questions, I'd like you to guide us toward the finish line. Any questions that you may have, I would love to hear it and then answer it as vulnerably as I can. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. 
Do you get much feedback from the students you talk to over the years? And the answer kind of is yes and no. There are always a few brave, intrepid kids that come running up afterwards. Yesterday was a profound experience in that regard. But, but I think the long tail matters even more. So I was speaking at a company called Enterprise in Dallas uh, on September 11th this year. Three ladies, beautiful ladies, 25 year old ladies came up and they said, Mr. O'Leary, when we were juniors in high school, you came to our high school in Wisconsin. Uh, that message has been with us through high school into college and it's still with us today. We're lucky and gl glad to meet you again. I never heard that from them when I was in the Fox Valley area in Wisconsin nine years ago. But to know that something maybe we said or something we did had an impact on three lovely ladies <laughs> inspires me to get on the next plane. Great question. What else? Yes, ma'am. How long did it take you when you were a little child to find your faith? How long did it take you as a little child to find your faith again? So the, the, you heard the abridged story today, of course, 30 minutes or so. When my mom came into the emergency room, she walked over, she told me she loved me. And then I asked her, mom, am I going to die? And her response to me was, baby, do you want to? Which for the mothers in the room and the fathers in the room and the leaders in the room, you realize that that is a bold question to set at your child's feet, the decision between life and death. And I said, mom, I don't want to die. I want to live. And her response back to me was good. Then look at me, baby. You take the hand of God, you walk the journey with him, and you fight like you have never, ever fought before. And on January 17th, 1987, nine-year-old burnt up kid decided to take the hand of God and walk with Jesus through the landmine that would be the next five months in the hospital and the next several decades of recovery, physically and emotionally. But I, I never had to refine my faith. I think faith is one of those things like a stock market. There are highs and lows. Uh, there have been periods in high school where I was not lit up in my faith. And yet to be surrounded by those who were kept me close to it. And then I went to a Jesuit college, which kept me close to my faith, even if I wasn't fully participating. I would go to church, but I wasn't all in. I think when I was 27 years old and I became a hospital chaplain working a couple days a week with kids is when I finally realized that indeed God works through all things, even childhood cancer, even huge losses, all things for a purpose. We can't fathom while we are here on earth. So today, I am all in in my faith. I try to evangelize in everything we say and everything we do, but frequently it's not in what I say, it's, it's really more in how we live. I think that's true for all of us. How about one more question and then we will wrap up. Anything else? I'm going to put down a screen while you are thinking about asking the question one final time. Put it down one more time if you don't mind. Thanks, Dominic. <coughs> Zig Ziglar, an old writer and speaker, used to say that motivation and inspiration last as long as your most recent shower. <laughs> and if you've been in front of these lights with a heavy sport jacket on dancing in front of a couple hundred, that is not very long today, my friends. So what I'd like you to do right now is to grab your cell phone and to text me your email address. And then tomorrow morning, when you wake up groggy eyed and the Hillary campaign and the Trump campaign is bringing you down to your knees, I'll be coming back into your life for the next seven days to remind you what we talked about today and how to live it today and tomorrow and beyond. So my number, and I encourage the students to do this as well, if you have your phones or write it down and maybe do it later on, my number is 314-380-5690, then your cell phone. I'm sorry, then your email address. And then hit send. So I'll say the number one more time in case the screen's blanking on you. 314-380-5690, your email address, send, be done. All right, if you're still texting, yes. Can I ask the last question? Yes, you may get the last. The last question's right here, people. So thanks for coming today. My name is Tim Temple, and I was curious about the effect that your journey had on your siblings. Awesome. In their faith life and how they've extended that in their communities and with their families. 
What a great way to end it. I wonder about how that tragedy impacted not only you, John, but also your siblings. What I can say about my siblings, I'll start with Jim. Jim is still a jerk. <laughs> but he's not at all. The, the tragedy refined him, as all tragedy does for us. Uh, the tragedy made him such a compassionate guy, actually, and such a vibrant guy. There are six O'Learys in the O'Leary family, and my parents are not perfect parents, but I think it's more than sheer chance that all six O'Leary kids are going to Mass actively every Sunday and are living sacramentally and believe in the word and believe that we know ultimately where we go. I, I think tragedy has a way in families, individually, as a community, as a country, to either divide or to unite. And we were united, not just by a fire, but more importantly, in our faith. When I got out of the hospital, besides John O'Leary did the, the ballpark, the first thing we did as a family and as a community is we went to mass together. And all those men and women and all the boys and girls who wrote letters and prayed for a little guy that had no chance came and we celebrated. We party. Catholics love to party. We party. It started in church and moved to the bar afterwards, but we party. We party. And I think it's important in life to be serious, to be faithful, but also to be fun. To be the kind of spirit that attracts rather than repulses. And to allow our hearts to do that rather than our words. You know? I think Jesus does a lot of miracles. He does a lot of fine teaching. But where he meets almost everybody that he converts is not in temple. It's not at mass. Where he meets almost everyone is at the well. It's by the pool. It's in homeroom. It's on the weekends. It's at recess. It's in the ordinary living of each day that I think we can do our finest work. So that, that's my challenge. It's also our invitation today as, as family to become the body of Christ and the community star for it. Uh, I, I want to, again, thank you for coming today. Juniors and seniors, beginning with you. As a teacher, you have an opportunity frequently to see heads that are falling asleep when you are presenting. And yet today, that was the farthest thing from the case. Your attention uh, moved me to your family and friends, parents and grandparents, donor city, maybe a little bit closer. You have given these children, these young men and women, the leaders of tomorrow, an incredible gift by sending them here. Uh, as a man from St. Louis who has walked a lot of schools and a lot of Catholic schools, I've never seen a place like this, ever. This is sacred space. So you ought to congratulate yourself to be part of a community this beautiful. I want to thank you all again for coming for pancakes. Hopefully O'Leary did not wash down this year, but in negative fashion. <laughs> Have an awesome morning. God bless you guys. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hey, man. Appreciate you. Um, thank you. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> Pancakes at Providence Academy is on the 18th of November. Mark the calendar. We'll see you then. <laughs> yes. Are you still down there in St. Louis? Yes. Did you go to Priory? No, I went to this semester actually. Priory is a great school, though. Are you a Priory grad? Well, my, one of my sons, Lou, 